Thank you to Koei Tecmo for the review copy for this video. It's been a while since the release of the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection. It received mixed reception from fans and critics. Wait, what is that intro? I was really excited for it, so what the hell happened? Why did people react like that? Well, it's almost entirely because they used the Sigma versions. What is a Sigma version, you may be asking? Simply put, they're the re-releases of the Ninja Gaiden games which had the suffix Sigma. They were updates of the originals that were outfitted with remixed content and upgraded visuals. This was so controversial because they made heavy changes to the structure of the first two games to the point where some people don't even consider them to be the same games. The reason these versions were included over the originals, which many fans consider to be better, is simple. The code for those games was lost. Forever. This kind of thing happens all the time in the industry, even for the biggest of games. Just look at Final Fantasy VII. The original games are still available in emulated form on Xbox consoles, so it's not like you can't still play them. And they can't exactly release those emulated versions outside of Xbox platforms. Okay, listen. I'm not here to play softball with a company. If you've seen my videos before, you will know well that I don't mince my words. But since they were transparent about the reasoning for this decision, I'm willing to take what I'm given at face value. After all, the Sigma versions of these games are still good, and anyone that says otherwise is, um, over-exaggerating a bit. So much of the discourse is about that than actually talking about the quality of the collection or the games. And that's the other reason I've taken so long to get this video out. I wanted to do these games justice, to explore what makes them tick from the ground up. I didn't want my thoughts on the games to be swept up in the wave of people complaining about the Sigma versions. Because I think these games are awesome, and I'd like to explain why. This video is going to be quite long, but it'll be broken up into sections talking about each game individually, with timestamps in the description. So if you feel that you need to stop and come back later, hopefully that helps you do just that. Now, with that preamble done, let's drop right in. As the first game in the rebooted series, Ninja Gaiden is a primer for what to expect from the direction of the franchise. Tonally, it's a deceptively discordant game. At times, it feels elegant and refined, like you're really a ninja roaming through all of these beautifully constructed areas, brimming with a thick atmosphere that you just want to soak in. And sometimes it can be, uh, <laughs> jarring? <laughs> This is best illustrated by the title screen. Upon booting up the game, you're treated to a subdued opening cinematic before the title screen proper, both of which are accompanied by melancholic music, setting a very solemn mood. But the moment you press a button, electric guitars start blaring. It's a brilliant showcase of Ninja Gaiden's tonal confusion. This game is delightfully trashy, and I like to think it's well aware of this, but the idea that the creators think that this is actually really cool is charming as well. You play as Ryu Hayabusa, a young ninja on a journey to recover a dangerous relic stolen from his clan by the mysterious samurai Doku. There are some twists and turns, and the music can make certain moments feel very heavy, but for the most part, it's set dressing, and Ninja Gaiden is focused on the gameplay and the adventure. Ninja Gaiden is a game that puts you right into the mindset of its protagonist. Like the original Devil May Cry, which encouraged taunting to make you feel more like its player character, Ninja Gaiden promotes a slower, more precise method of combat. The opening level teaches you that, if you do not defend against enemy attacks, you will meet a quick end. You have to be much more deliberate with your actions to successfully rout your enemies. Ninja Gaiden has a reputation for being a bit uh, unfair with its difficulty, and you can pretty clearly see that when the first boss breaks the pre-established rules the first level set immediately by punishing you for blocking attacks. While frustrating at first, this is also a lesson to learn. It teaches you that you cannot passively defend against attacks. You need to be more proactive. You need to keep calm and collected, making use of your dodges and mobility, and only block and counter while an enemy is already attacking. This is the key to overcoming your foes. If you don't keep your cool like Ryu would in these situations, you'll end up getting sloppy and leaving yourself wide open. If you aren't careful, enemies can deplete your health in an instant. What the fuck just happened? 
That might also happen because enemies can just pull you out of your block with no warning. This happens a bit too much. Light attacks and heavy attacks string together into combos, and you need to learn the ins and outs of them in order to know what move will best deal with your current group of enemies. This requires going into the pause menu and reading what combos are possible with your currently equipped weapon, but once you do that, it becomes pretty intuitive and a lot of weapons have overlapping combo strings. Mix that with Ninpo, which allows you to perform powerful magic attacks, and there's a good dichotomy of techniques at your disposal. Each move in NG feels very crunchy, powerful, and purposeful. It can feel great to decimate enemies with your sheer strength alone. There are also projectile weapons, which are a bit less useful, as aside from your default shuriken and the windmill shuriken, they have very limited ammo. They also just straight up can't do damage to certain enemies, so they feel like little more than an afterthought for most encounters. Once you upgrade yourself, get more moves, and most specifically acquire the Izuna drop scroll, the game feels like it opens up a tremendous amount. The Izuna drop is just... Satisfying is underselling it. It's so cool and has extra utility in that it knocks away anything caught in its blast. It's so useful that I began to plan my method of attack around how most efficiently I could Izuna drop into a set of enemies. The Izuna drop became so integral to my playstyle that I almost exclusively used weapons that could perform the technique. However, larger enemies cannot be juggled and dropped, which is objectively bad. So in those instances, I did play around with the other weapons, and you know, they're pretty fun to use. There are large differences between each weapon class's capabilities and differences between the weapons within those classes. You got heavy weapons, a staff, flails, and swords. There's a joke weapon you could purchase early on that, when fully upgraded, becomes th the most powerful weapon in the game. Personally, the base katana set you start with and grow over the course of the game is my favorite. It's incredibly fine-tuned and satisfying to use, and that easing to drop is just... It's nice. Probably my favorite action game weapon of the era that this game came out. The defining thing that makes each weapon useful is their ultimate techniques, which are moves used by charging heavy attack. It can take a while to charge up, but the better weapons deal out a very potent combo when you use them. Essences used to upgrade yourself, restore ninpo, and restore health are dropped by enemies upon defeat. You can forego these rewards and absorb essence by charging heavy attack to more quickly perform a UT, with health and key restoring ninpo giving you instant access to the level 2 UT. This creates a very interesting risk reward system. Do you need to recover right away, or can you risk it for the sake of unleashing carnage? It's an interesting gambit. You also gain much more essence from executing the level 2 UT, so there's even more incentive to try your hand. The difficulty of the game reaches its boiling point in some of the boss encounters. A lot of bosses have a fuck you attack where they come at you really fast and take off like half your health bar. Sometimes it can be so quick that I didn't have time to fully dodge out of the way. Uh, that's probably just because I have the reflexes of a sloth. I still enjoyed most of the boss fights very much, especially the ones against grounded enemies where they fight you more traditionally, and overcoming a tough challenge after dozens of attempts feels really good. I felt like the dragon and worm bosses weren't fun, the worms especially could fuck off, but I generally did like the majority of the boss fights. Those bosses can be a bit aggravating if you don't have an adequate supply of healing items. There is a talisman that revives you on death, but you can only carry one and it's just used no matter what when you die. So if you get hit enough to trigger it, oh well, it's gone. A majority of my deaths came from bosses just wrecking me with the aforementioned fuck you moves. So, uh, there's an extra six or so hours on my total game time because of that. There are save points situated near most fights and Sigma includes even more. So you conceptually have a pretty decent safety net. Regardless, aside from choice boss encounters, Ninja Gaiden is an excellent game. Enjoyable from start to finish. The ghost piranhas can fuck right off though. And the worms! Did you know that in Sigma they added a second worm in the fire worm boss fight? Yeah, uh, fuck that! The narrative is broken up into chapters, but don't let that fool you into thinking this is some linear game. 
Ninja Gaiden has a large interconnected world, and for the most part, you can backtrack and explore nearly the entire map whenever the urge arises. Some routes intersect into previous areas in very interesting and unexpected ways. It really feels like an adventure, and part of the adventure is putting your skills as a ninja to the test with environmental traversal and puzzles. Ryu just feels good to move around with. Wall riding, bird flipping, water running, even swimming feels really satisfying. There's plenty of exploration, and exploring every nook and cranny is quite important. There are optional upgrades strewn about the levels that you can use to enhance Ryu's health, the power of his ninpo, and even unlock items and entire weapons. Sigma removes and adds levels, but that's not quite the whole truth. The added levels where you play as Rachel are not really new levels. They have you either revisit areas that you just completed, or whisk you off to later ones Ryu hasn't been through yet. They can break the pacing of the game, but they're not the worst thing in the world. Still Ninja Gaiden. She has her own kit that, while not as deep or as satisfying as Ryu's, has its own unique utility that can be fun to mess around with. They do interrupt the flow of the game, though, and spoil some cool areas that you'll be going through soon, so I would have preferred her levels to just be an additional campaign, instead of intersecting with the main story. She does get her own unique boss fight, though, which is, uh... It's fine, I guess. Personally, while I'm still sad about the removed levels, I am okay with Sigma's inclusion over the original Xbox game. Especially this version, which restores a bit of the content missing from the original Sigma, like the intro movie. There's even additional upgrades from Sigma Plus, the, the Vita version. The other changes Sigma makes feel deliberate and smart. One of the biggest changes is that you can cycle through and use healing items without pausing and going into a menu. And while I would have preferred the environmental traversal puzzles of the original, removing them in favor of a much more linear and streamlined structure does put Sigma more in line with the other two games in the trilogy. Sigma has a reputation for lowering the difficulty, and while it does make certain sections easier, it also makes certain sections harder, so it's not a full difficulty nerf. To be honest, I welcome the added leniency of Sigma. The original was uh, punishing to a fault. Lacking sufficient checkpoints, making it harder to approach than a lot of games in the genre. The addition of more save points makes the experience miles less frustrating. If it lets more people beat the game, I have no problem with it. And you know, they are optional, right? It's not hurting anyone. Regardless of the changes, Ninja Gaiden Sigma is still a legendary game worth your time. Especially if you've never experienced it before. It is very content rich. There are plenty of higher difficulties if you're into ball busting and a mission mode, so there's quite a bit to do here. The original game had a new game plus that lets you carry over your upgrades and weapons, so it's sad that that feature is gone, but uh, now you can upload your total campaign score to a leaderboard. That's cool, right? Tough as Nails action games have gained a new audience in the time that this series has been absent, so maybe fans of those games will get something out of Ninja Gaiden. Ninja Gaiden 2 is fucking insane. I uh I don't feel like I can adequately describe how I how I feel playing this game. Ninja Gaiden 2 is pure unfiltered lunacy packaged and contained in a 10-hour game, and I am here for it. The dial gets cranked up to 11 from the get-go. Ninja Gaiden 1, fairly understated experience. Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2, giant Buddha statue boss fight within the first 30 minutes of the game. NG2 follows mostly the same setup as the first game, some bad dudes wreck Ryu's shit and he has to stop them. The difference is in the details though, because this time, we're going across the entire globe and partaking in complete nonsense. One minute you're in a futuristic Japan, the next a flamboyant angel with an obsession over the Statue of Liberty wreaks havoc on New York. Werewolves swarm Venice and Ryu just, like, casually turns the corner while all of these people are running for their lives like, yeah, this is normal. It's wild. The lunacy extends to the gameplay. Combat has been jazzed up significantly. Animations are more fluid, more free-flowing. 
NG2 is just an improvement all around, fine-tuned to be so much faster and smoother and way, way, way more extreme. Instead of the Izuna drop causing an enemy to awkwardly die after being smashed into the ground, uh, they explode on impact. There's a lot of exploding bits now. You cut off the limbs of your enemies and you can use a heavy attack to obliterate them. You can do this to a majority of the bosses. Just look at Ryu go! Most importantly, in Sigma 2, you start the game with the Izuna drop available. You can Izuna drop the main villain. You can drop with nearly every weapon in the game now, including the heavy weapon, which is a uh, pure euphoria. Even the ultimate techniques are supercharged. They get downright ridiculous the further you get into the game. The Kusari Gama, probably my favorite weapon in all of gaming, just rips through enemies with this insane AoE. Just goddamn. Every single level is this roller coaster taking you through a wild ride from start to finish. You go into the underground subway of New York City and there's there's just a giant skeleton monster down there for no reason. Ryu Hayabusa rides out of a crashing plane on a motorcycle and then gets immediately jumped by a giant fire turtle? There is no explanation? This just happens. This game makes me lightheaded. The more linear structure means you can replay individual levels without having to go through the entire campaign. Another feature that Sigma 2 added. This change is very welcome because it means I can relive specific moments of this game's insanity whenever I want. There are even more bosses, and after a point, they just keep getting better and better. Even the big guys are fun to fight. While these types of battles frustrated and annoyed me in the original, I'm, I'm just like basking in the absurdity now. I just, I just laugh off the bullshit. The giant fire turtle explodes when you beat it. You can die from this. It's funny. It also helps that Sigma 2 is a lot easier. On that note, Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 is a, a bit of a controversial game, and this version probably more so. Sigma 2 is this weird censored version of NG2 where purple mist spouts out of enemies upon defeat and the blood is toned down significantly. While this version of Sigma 2 includes plenty of content from the Vita version, Sigma 2 Plus, it does not have a toggle to restore the blood and violence of the original NG2, which Plus did. While I personally don't particularly care too much about the blood myself, it does make this game feel especially weird when placed in between the two other games in this package. The lack of an option for this is perplexing, and I can only theorize that they lost this content just like they did with the original two Ninja Gaiden games. More than that, however, the tweaks and changes received mixed reception. As I said, the difficulty is lessened, but it's to an extremely big extent. Entire fights are removed and replaced, and there's a pretty big nerf to the amount of mooks on the screen at the time. This has led Sigma 2 to be a pretty contentious game among fans. Ninja Gaiden 2 OG threw hordes of enemies at you. Sigma 2 usually just sends three at a time. Because it's Ninja Gaiden, every single enemy was incredibly lethal, so the large hordes made it much more grueling than the original Ninja Gaiden. While this was ridiculous and very stupidly difficult, there is something lost in no longer overcoming dozens of enemies at a time. That's like the one questionable decision and bit of insanity that Sigma 2 just straight up removes. The lower amount of enemies makes the game feel much more considered and balanced, and combined with the new way that Ninja Gaiden 2 handles health, I feel more comfortable with this game than the preceding one. Instead of scavenging health items, you are healed at the end of every battle, which I consider a direct improvement to how health worked in NG1. I often felt unfairly punished when I was hit with mega huge attacks that would just cripple Ryu for the rest of a level. I often resorted to grinding essence to buy as many healing items as I could before an annoying boss battle. So to me, this is just removing unnecessary busy work. You can also choose whether or not to use a revival talisman now. Wow! Another Sigma 2 change. You have unlimited ammo for your bow, which, well, I'm completely okay with. The bow's usage in combat was pretty limited, and there would just be a dead ninja or trunk with unlimited arrows nearby whenever you needed the bow for something, so again, this just removes more busy work. And you have the bow and shuriken at all times. You can also move while aiming, and aiming will lock onto enemies, specifically seeking out other enemies with projectile weapons. I like it. I used the bow a lot more in Sigma 2 than any prior game. 
There are two changes in Sigma 2 that I'd say are definite downgrades. The first is that the game no longer gives you a grade after every mission, only when you replay the level. The second is how it handles weapon upgrades. In previous games, you would buy upgrades and items at locations throughout the level. This promoted deliberate thinking, needing you to consider what to prioritize and what you need to succeed. Sigma 2 just hands you weapon upgrades at specific blue statues and only one at a time, with higher levels being locked behind an arbitrary point in the campaign. If you want to focus on a specific weapon because you like it more, you aren't allowed to get that weapon to peak efficiency as soon as possible. The upgrades being free and ammo being unlimited means you don't have to make a choice between them and healing items, which is on the surface a bad change. This means you can just go gung-ho and buy all the healing items you want, which can trivialize the difficulty. I won't lie though, I don't care. As I said, I'd just stock up on as many items as I could before a particularly frustrating encounter anyway, so well, this is just cutting out busy work. If you're really in this for the hardcore experience, I'd like to again stress that, uh, this is optional. NG2 ended up being a lot shorter than the first game for me, supported by my total playtime. This is just because I spent a whole lot less time grinding and dying. The campaign feels just as meaty as the first game, and it's as content rich too, with additional modes and difficulties and plenty of replay value. There's a tag mission mode where two ninjas run around a level beating people up. This used to have online multiplayer, it unfortunately does not anymore. There's also this weird ninja race mode, which I personally cannot get into. I feel like the additions Sigma 2 made to the original two are very good and very in line with how ridiculous the original game was. One of the new bosses included in Sigma 2 is a possessed Statue of Liberty, which makes me go numb in the brain. Bigger changes include additional levels and changes to levels that let you go through them a lot faster. In particular, they removed all underwater combat, which is appreciated because it wasn't good. The new levels where you play as the girls are an improvement over Rachel's from Sigma, showing me that the more linear level design was the right call. The new playable character Ayane feels much more in tune with Hayabusa in her kit, and she has her own version of the Izuna drop. Momiji from the DS game Dragon Sword is also playable. She can drop too. Despite literally not being in Ninja Gaiden 2, Rachel returns with her own level, and while she doesn't have a drop, she has a big gun now. Ryu has a big gun too. Ultimately, I can pretty definitively say that while it's up to you if you prefer Sigma 2 or the original 2, I like Sigma 2 better, because they removed the fucking warm boss fight. Sigma 2 is a game I revel in, and it is a rollicking good time. I love Ninja Gaiden 2, and Sigma 2 is no exception to that. Ninja Gaiden 3 is the final game in this collection. The version included may seem out of place to those unfamiliar with Ninja Gaiden, as it's the only game here not called Sigma, but it was actually initially planned as Sigma 3, and for reasons I do not know, it was renamed and given the subtitle of Razor's Edge. It is still a retooling of an original Ninja Gaiden game, and it is by far and away the one on here with the most substantial improvements over its original incarnation. To make a long story short, Ninja Gaiden 3 is a lot more story heavy than the other games, and the premise itself deals with some heavy topics. It decided it wanted to bring the morality of Ryo Hayabusa's actions into question. Is he a hero or a murderer? Hero or murderer? Hey wait, I just said that! The game was designed around this premise. Enemies begged for their lives and whimpered in fear. There was an infamous sequence in the first level where the player has to execute a terrorist pleading to be spared, talking about his family, and breaking down in fear before you slice clean through him. That's just gone now. Another similar sequence later was also excised. The core premise too is quite a bit different from past games. Instead of going on a MacGuffin hunt, Ryu is trying to rid himself of a deadly curse. He has been afflicted with something called the Grip of Murder, a physical manifestation of the guilt he feels from all the lives he has taken. With only a week to live, he suffers more and more from it over the course of the game. 
and eventually is running on sheer force of will alone while the clock ticks down. It's rough to watch, and a cool premise on the surface. As a fan of Ninja Gaiden, I already know Ryu, and I'm invested in his plight, but it falls flat if you don't know who he is, because he is a bit of a psycho, especially in 3's original release. The story never really delves far enough into if Ryu is a bad guy or not, refusing to give a definitive answer. You called me a murderer. No. And then it completely throws the question out the window in the last cutscene of the game. You are not a murderer. <laughs> You're not exactly a hero either. I get trying to make the answer ambiguous, more up to the player, but they didn't commit, so the much heavier scenes being removed makes this scenario now little more than set dressing, which I guess puts it more in line with standard Ninja Gaiden fare. Where Ninja Gaiden 3 still feels removed from the original two games is that the story spends a whole lot of time talking and mulling over its own premise. Going from 2 and its complete lack of restraint into this very reserved and structured game is hella whiplash. It still goes off the rails at times, but those moments now feel out of place with how much the game spends on quieter, more personal and serious dialogue scenes. Tell me about the dinosaurs. The crux of the story revolves around Ryu becoming kinder and more human due to befriending a little girl named Kana. It's his driving motivation for finishing his mission, despite being on the brink of death. One particular sequence has him carry her out of a facility, desperately trying to shield her from the horrors of his job of cutting down others as a ninja. Close your eyes. Don't look at anything. Don't listen to anything. You shut everything out. It's quite an effective scene. It's one of the few effective uses of violence to shock the player, considering they are right there with Ryu and not wanting this innocent little girl to be in this situation. In the original three, scenes of Ryu bonding with Kana were interspersed with Ryu being a psychopath, killing people begging for their lives, while he still does, uh, murder people. Removing any empathy one could have for Ryu's enemies makes this scenario work a bit better. The only remaining execution scene is against an unquestionably evil person who taunts Ryu into killing him after kidnapping Kana which strengthens the feeling that Ryu cares for this girl even though he's only known her for about six days. I do think Ninja Gaiden 3 has the basis for a good story. The stoic and unfeeling man being softened by a child trope is pretty overdone, but it wasn't at the time that this game came out. If the writing was better, I think this could have really worked, because it does at the climax of the story. I'm a pretty emotional person myself, so I get choked up over the sincere sentimentality of everything. I like that it's so true to itself. In its new form in Razor's Edge, I do think this story works a lot better. It's not like they brought in somebody who knows nothing about Ninja Gaiden to pen this new story. I mean, Masoto Kato was a writer and story director on the original NES trilogy. And if you still think he's not a good writer, maybe you should, uh... Check out the other stuff he's done. That's not to say he couldn't write a bad story, but I think he did a pretty adequate job here. If you think I've been talking about the story for a long time, it's because the game spends a lot of time on it too. This was the new direction for Ninja Gaiden, a much more narrative-heavy game with less emphasis on exploration than before. And people weren't so kind to Ninja Gaiden 3. This new vision for the series was not received well. The focus on narrative had them make enemies far weaker and the game an overall cakewalk, so that players could more easily experience the expensive cutscenes they meticulously mo-capped, choreographed, and animated. And despite handling some heavy topics, they also toned down the violence? I keep talking about the original Ninja Gaiden 3 even though that's not the version here, but that's because I really want to highlight just how much of a dramatic improvement Razor's Edge is. Razor's Edge is a complete overhaul that tweaks the hell out of levels, mechanics, and balance far more than either Sigma game. It adds content that was missing from the original that feels like it should have always been there. Can you believe the original NG3 only had the sword? 
RE rectifies this by inserting weapons from two. But the way they are obtained in the campaign feels uh, rather slapdash, given to you at save checkpoints, and one is given to you during a cutscene, interrupting Ryu's dial- Log. That's emblematic of how rushed this retooling of 3 was. In a few short months, they turned a poor excuse for a Ninja Gaiden game into a pretty good one. Other changes include a severe dearth of enemy variety being haphazardly addressed by just slapping in a bunch of two's enemies. Secrets were added. Collecting scarabs allows you to unlock additional weapons and health upgrades similar to the original game. But uh, th these are just hidden along the beaten path, usually in plain sight, since they didn't have time to expand the levels. Those levels are also lacking compared to prior games. Exploration is completely out the window, and while there are cool platforming sections, that's pretty much the only remnant of the traversal from previous games. No water running, no swimming. Now you have kunai climbing sections, weird out of place forced stealth, and the odd walking segment. The game is more like a movie with playable levels you run through between all the story beats. This is how most action games are these days, but it's a little disappointing to see, considering the franchise's roots and just how good that first game's traversal felt. There are many additions to Ninja Gaiden 3 RE to make it a much more fast-paced and spectacle-based action game, letting it have an identity of its own. Some of those are more beneficial than others. Starting on the positive side, the core combat is a big step up over previous games. That's right, it's controversial opinion time. I think Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge has the best combat in the series. Attack animations are way snappier, crunchier, and feel so much more impactful. Ultimate techniques are even meatier than in Ninja Gaiden 2. The Izuna drop has never felt better. Every weapon can Izuna drop now. A big win for all drop connoisseurs out there. They even gave it to the Kisarigama. I've... I've never wanted anything more. It's beautiful. Just like with Sigma 2, you can use your shurikens and bow at the same time. The bow has been buffed, gaining explosive arrows and the ability to shoot two at once over the course of the campaign. The catharsis of locking on to an RPG guy and being able to take them out in one clean shot while in the heat of battle... feels good. You can even aim in the air in exchange for some key energy, which is an essential ability for the, the helicopter boss fights. Key in general feels like a much more integral part of the combat system than it ever was before. There are new techniques that use key, like the aforementioned mid-air aiming and an instant dodge. Healing items are gone, instead you use key energy or ninpo attacks to heal, giving ninpo much greater usage as well. I personally feel that healing items in action games are a crutch to unpolished level design and balancing, so this new system theoretically means you're getting by on your own wits alone, without the temptation of abusing healing items. <laughs> to add to that extra feeling of accomplishment, 3 RE directly rewards you for performing well in combat, unlike before, which is something I always appreciate in an action game. The Karma score points of old now function as your currency to buy upgrades, which can be accessed at any time in the menu. If you perform better, you can unlock things sooner, including those new key techniques I mentioned before. Essence from the old games is gone, now just performing better in combat triggers Bloody Rage, which allows for those faster ultimate techniques. You can even build up a multiplayer to gain extra karma by defeating more enemies before popping off. Another risk-reward system. Oh, and in case uh, you haven't been looking at the screen, they added back the intense violence that was missing from Sigma 2 in the original Ninja Gaiden 3. In fact, this game goes super overboard, becoming the most violent and often slapstick game in the series due to how much the enemies scream expletives while being chopped to bits. Which leads pretty nicely into the last big addition to the series that this game brings. New to 3 is Steel on Bone, which in RE functions as a counter, letting you intercept enemies and deal a powerful instant kill, adding on to your defensive capabilities. An incoming rage attack, signified by the enemy glowing red, can be stopped with a strong blow, executing Steel on Bone, which instantly decimates that enemy, 
and you can chain instant kills on enemies around you, up to four at max weapon level. Doing so regains a little bit of health and builds up key energy very fast. It's very satisfying. The Kusari Gama is incredible at Steel on Bone. If an enemy is out of range, Ryu just yanks them over to rip them to shreds. They made the coolest weapon in video games even cooler. The best encounters of Ninja Gaiden 3 have you sliding through danger, popping off a couple steel on bones, and picking off RPG wielding enemies with a flick of the wrist while you make a mad dash around the arena, Izuna dropping everyone in your way. It's a shame that the level design is unbalanced and unpolished. While theoretically the combat system should promote more skillful play, the game was not sufficiently tweaked around these new systems. Due to the rushed nature of RE, enemy numbers can sometimes feel increased without care, and they come at you in heavy waves. They are also now extremely aggressive, dealing a ton of damage and being far more prone to suicide attacks. So overcoming the odds is no small task, but when you finally do, it's quite a feeling. 3 changes the ranking system. The game rewards you with a letter grade after every combat encounter, for both time taken and health remaining. This really adds to the sense of satisfaction of overcoming a fierce barrage of enemies. With how many S ranks I was getting towards the end of the game, I felt like I was getting really really good. A boon of sprinting through all three of these games back to back I guess. Where the difficulty increases are felt most are in the boss fights. Bosses have been made ridiculously strong and sometimes it can be a struggle to survive. I never felt like bosses were cheap shotting me at least, and like the original games, there's something to be said about the sheer satisfaction of beating a tough boss after dozens of failed attempts, which is something the Sigma version of 2 did lack. Some boss encounters feel like a test of patience, requiring thorough examination of their attack patterns, trying and trying again to beat them. In this area, Razor's Edge feels more like the first games than Sigma 2 did. Bosses became the biggest source of my deaths again, and yeah, that definitely added a couple hours onto my playtime. Your patience is strained to the absolute limit in the final boss, where you need to charge up your key to do a Nimpo attack to trigger the second phase of the fight, and the meter for this is, uh... The fuck is this even? <laughs> Does feel good when you finally get that, though. Let's fucking go! The fights that most frustrated me in the original were with generic one-note monsters. But in this game, the ones that fucked with my brain the most are much more conceptually interesting. A man that's the complete opposite of Ryu in fighting style and personality parries the ever-loving shit out of all of your moves, and I felt a pure feeling of exhilaration every time I decked him in. I felt a similar feeling with most of the boss fights. Along with a proper rival, they finally introduced a shadow version of your main character, which is also a pain in the ass. But well, when the thing I'm constantly dying to is Shadow Ryu Hayabusa Izuna dropping me? I, I can't even be mad. That's the funniest thing in the entire series. The most confusing additions to 3 are the new QTE sequences. It feels really weird coming from 2, which let Ryu do all of this crazy shit on his own, but I guess they wanted to make these sequences more interactive. I've rarely ever seen these integrated well into an action game, and to give credit where it's due, Ari does have some of the best integration of scripted sequences that I've ever seen. It removed all of the bad QTEs from Original 3, with the only remaining ones using the same buttons and inputs for reuse techniques as the regular game. This feels quite good when you're dodging stuff in the air just like you would on the ground. The spectacle can feel invigorating when it's done right. If you turn off the tutorials and the options, you don't even get the button prompts at all anymore, which helps them feel a bit more elegant. On that note though, I want to talk about one thing. So the scene where you carry Kana. I turned off the tutorial text pretty early on in the game because I know how to play Ninja Gaiden, and the tutorial text constantly telling you what to do is quite patronizing. This one section needs you to hold LT to carry Kana, and you'll only know that if you have the tutorial on. They really shouldn't have had the button prompts and tutorial text on the same toggle. The campaign is extremely short, with the overall runtime being lengthened mostly by the increased focus on cinematics. The amount of levels is nearly half of the previous games. RE tries to alleviate this a little bit by introducing a few levels where you play as Ayane, complete with her kit from Sigma 2, and my god, they're actually new levels this time. They, they finally did it. 
they finally gave an expansion character holy new levels. Thank you. And when I said prior that there are no new weapons to play around with, that's a half-truth. Razor's Edge adds Kasumi from the Dead or Alive series into the mix with an entirely new kit, complete with her own ninpo and projectile weapons. She even brings back the Windmill Shuriken, which was absent from Sigma 2. She feels like a fun mix of Ryu and Ayane, incorporating some of her defining DOA techniques like her teleport, and she even has her own version of the Izuna drop, like the other additional characters, which feels very good. Momiji is also unlockable, and actually quite a bit different from how she played in Sigma 2, so there's even more to play around with. These two ladies do not have their own levels since they were added in free updates originally, but being able to replay story chapters with these characters does help highlight just how fun every character is to play in this game. All three of the additional characters function on the same gameplay systems as Ryu, meaning they can do steel on bone and obliteration. There's good incentive for replaying levels as these characters. You are still limited to the same selection of 10 levels, but they are also available to play as in the Ninja Trials at least. There was additional content behind the Ninja Trials where you could build your own ninja, upgrading him by using him in the Trials and in multiplayer. He had access to all of Ryu's weapons, and was basically an alternate Ryu with some neat cosmetic options. You could also have a friend join you, like the tag missions from Sigma 2. This was linked to an online battle mode where you could compete against other players' ninjas with your own. It's insane. You can Izuna drop your friends. No one plays this anymore, and that makes me sad. Unfortunately, like the online content from Sigma 2, that's completely gone now. It's a shame too, there are not a lot of 3D action games out there with online co-op or deathmatches. At the very least I would have liked the training room from this mode to remain, because having a training room in your action game to test all your moves in is kinda important. Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge feels like a small step forward for the franchise, but that step is shackled by sometimes mediocre level design, a lack of new weapons, and an over-reliance on cinematics and spectacle. There are some good moments. Don't you ever get cold in that get-up, Hayabusa? No. But when the game meanders, it often blunders and fails to stick the landing. I wish that, since they were going down this path anyway, they committed to actually examining Ryu's morality, because it's not like he hasn't killed innocents in the past. Even if they decided at the end that Ryu is justified in his actions and is a hero, it would have been more than the non-committal ending offered up here, and I might have even said it was successful. At the very least, the emotional core is there. Ryu Hayabusa is a father now, and that's pretty funny. Team Ninja excised the excessively bad parts of the game and did the best they could to elevate the rest. With how quick the turnaround from a bad Ninja Gaiden to a good one was, I feel confident in saying that this franchise is in safe hands. It's earnest to its core, and for that, I love Ninja Gaiden 3, Razor's Edge. Now I know LOA is up to something. Tell me about the dinosaurs. Tell me about the dinosaurs! Yeah! 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 What, what, what the? What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? The Master Collection lands on a bittersweet note. While I love Razor's Edge, I can recognize that it's a very flawed game. And though it wasn't the nail in Ninja Gaiden's coffin that it could have been, it is the last game we've had in the main series for almost a decade. I'm glad to see Ryu Hayabusa back, and I think the Master Collection is really solid. But I'd feel a lot more confident about this package if it was confirmed that there was a new game on the horizon. As I said at the beginning, and constantly during the course of the video, I hope I wasn't annoying, there's a lot of misplaced anger toward the Sigma versions being used over the originals. To be honest, I was initially a part of that. But after playing them again, I got over it, because these games are still really, really good. If this is the form that these three games are stuck in for the rest of time, I'm okay with that. I love them all, and if anything, I want more. I've been playing the PC version for this review, which I just need to talk about for a second because holy hell was it really strange at launch. There were no graphics options and it always launched in windowed mode. To go full screen you had to use Windows's own maximize button and other problems including having no quick way to immediately quit the game, Alt F4 did not work, 
and only having three resolution options, really made this port strange. Even stranger, to set your resolution, you had to go into the launch options on Steam and type it in there. Not even a launcher. I'd never seen another PC port like this. But about a month after launch, all of these issues were addressed and they added a fourth resolution. The options are bare bones, but they're there now. I feel pretty weird having to defend this collection because I'm used to really bad HD conversions getting an easy pass because they're just how I remember it, or the old games didn't look that good to begin with. But the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection is not the lazy port that I keep seeing people call it. I hate that phrasing because developers are rarely lazy. Bad results usually come about from a lack of time or a lack of skill. And the problems with the collection are definitely because of the former. They made plenty of tweaks and adjustments and clearly care about these games. Sigma 2 in particular had awful input lag at launch. But by the time I had gotten to it, they had released a patch for it that seemingly addressed the issue. And I had no trouble with the game after that. A lot of ports tend to miss the mark. And aside from a few issues, these games are in a pretty good working condition. As ideal as you'd want them to be. And, as I said, they're clearly paying attention to feedback because they fixed almost every issue people have brought up with the ports. They just released the game a bit too soon, as evidenced by how weird that initial launch was. And I was confident that given a month or two, this collection would be in tip-top shape, worthy of a series as great as Ninja Gaiden. I'm glad it takes me a stupid long time to make these videos because, lo and behold, they delivered. I just wish that they took that additional time fixing it before putting it out, because that launch soured a lot of people on this otherwise great package. Seriously, all three games run like butter on the recommended hardware, which itself is pretty generous. My 7 year old PC has no trouble shredding out 1080p 60fps in all three games. I mean, they better run well, they're all PS3 games. Sigma 2 and Razor's Edge in particular are greatly enhanced by finally running at a stable 60 frames per second and having way, way better load times. Razor's Edge gets the biggest glow up, looking great even to this day and now being silky smooth, which really enhances the much more frantic gameplay of that title. In the end though, the gameplay on all three of these games has never felt better, and that's the most important part. It's a joy to be able to play them without dropping frames or going into slow-mo every few seconds. If you get the deluxe package, you get a collection of art and music from the series. It's nifty to sift through, and it's nice finally having some more crisp audio of a lot of these songs. I'd say it's essential for Ninja Gaiden fanatics, since it's only a $5 difference. Since I am a Ninja Gaiden fanatic, being able to listen to this music in the background while making this video, it's been a great boon to me. I realize I reviewed the PC versions, but we have a pretty heavy Nintendo audience. So we also purchased the Switch version for ourselves. To find out how that stacks up, I'll hand this review over to my ninja accomplice Spazzy for just a minute. Hi guys, Spazzy here. I just wanted to chime in because I actually own the Switch version of the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection. And I know there were some questions about performance on the Switch, so here we go. Overall, I, I don't think it's too bad. Ninja Gaiden Sigma, I think, runs perfectly great. There were no issues I saw during my playthrough. Full disclosure, I'm not somebody that is overly affected by things like frame rate drops or dynamic resolution switches. I think maybe just because I'm kind of an old school gamer and I'm used to those sort of things, but I, I really didn't notice anything. I think that was a fine port. Ninja Gaiden Razor's Edge is another one where there were a few issues, but nothing really that distracting. In fact, I would say it was very comparable to the playthrough I did for it on the Wii U back in the day. So I think that one is, is also good. There's uh, a few hiccups, but I mean, nothing bad at all. Where the issues come in is Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2, which is a, a bit disappointing actually, because Sigma 2, as opposed to the original Ninja Gaiden 2, already has a cap on enemies. But during heavy action scenes and, and even cutscenes, there are some frame rate issues that 
I noticed and some resolution issues that I noticed, especially in handheld mode. And once again, I'm somebody that is not overly affected by these sort of things. That being said, it's still completely playable, but for Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 in particular, there are some points where the frame rate drops noticeably. And if you're the sort of person that that bothers you, you might want to look to play this collection on a different platform. Overall, uh, the Switch performance was okay, but as I mentioned, there are going to be other platforms that if you own, I, I would suggest maybe playing it there if you don't care about the handheld aspect of it, and things like, you know, frame rate issues do bother you. Thanks, Bazzy. So that's the verdict on the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection. I can't say it enough. I love all these games, and I feel comfortable saying that this collection is very good, and a very good value proposition. I think you should give it a try if you're interested, and I hope you like it. Especially if you're one of those people that left a negative review for this game without playing it because it was the Sigma versions. What the hell? Ninja Gaiden is still Ninja Gaiden. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm cool, I'm cool. This Master Collection has gotten me thinking about the idea that in the future, a game will take Razor's Edge's core gameplay and complement it with better levels, more content, better integration of additional characters, and a more confident narrative. I think they can pull it off, and I hope they make it as crazy as two. Or uh, they can do whatever they want with it. I just want a new Ninja Gaiden game, and I'm ready for Ninja Gaiden 4 if Team Ninja ever decides they want to make it. <laughs>